This sermon this afternoon is not a continuation as such of this morning, but it's talking about the same thing because this morning we emphasized, first of all, the type of soils or minds of men or hearts of men that the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, is sown into. The people we teach, the disposition of heart they have toward spiritual things, the word of God in this case. We also talked about the kinds of people that are out there, some people not knowing they're lost, others knowing they're lost but not knowing what to do about it, and some knowing they're lost and know what to do about it, and, and they act upon it. So as we go out to preach the gospel, we need to be aware of those who fall into those categories. And you may never know that as you sow the seed of the kingdom or teach the truth or preach the word. But they are there. All you can do is determine by their response what you can go further or do further with them in teaching them the truth. It doesn't take very long for some to let you know we don't have any time for that. It may be, say, if you're a friend of them in some way that they'll put up with you for a while, but in time make all sorts of excuses to get away from studying matters that are essential to their salvation. But whatever it is, in time you will know. And then there will be those who you will never know how the word that you taught them or the example of godliness you set before them impacted their own lives, how they saw themselves, how they saw the design and purpose of life in the flesh on earth, what they are to do while they're here. For we're all rushing quickly on to an eternity where there is no end. If we could just see in the proper understanding of the Bible what is before us, and we can, we want to, at least see enough, then if we could get all to see that, it would change a great many things, even so among God's own people. But this afternoon, I want us to look at three sermons, not the totality of the sermons, but the results of the word being preached, the impact it had on people, how they treated the truth. The first one you're very familiar with is the day the Lord established His church on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ as the inspired Luke records in Acts chapter 2. Peter, of course, standing up with the other apostles is being guided directly by the Holy Spirit, seeing that they have undergone the baptismal measure of the Spirit necessary for them to do what the Lord called them to do as his witnesses. So they're preaching directly from heaven, if you want to call it that, by the Holy Spirit. And when Peter reaches a stage here of having proven that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, his sermon is interrupted. And I don't know of a gospel preacher anywhere that wouldn't like to have every sermon he preached interrupted like this one was interrupted. Because in verse 36, when he draws his conclusion based upon all the evidence that's preceded, including the miracles that prove that his message was from heaven and not from man, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And of course, prior to this, he had emphasized that the Lord did not leave Jesus dead, but that he was raised from the dead and was now sitting at the right hand of God and ruling over his kingdom. But at this point, the faith that had been formed in those people by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, comes out. And they are of the ground that we would describe and did study this morning as Luke 8 and verse 15. They had received the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, in good and honest hearts. They couldn't be quiet any longer. And so, now when they heard this, that is the conclusion drawn based upon adequate evidence and confirming that the word of God was from heaven and not from men, they were pricked in their heart. Now remember, we noticed Luke 8, 15, that the seed was sown, the word of God, and it brought forth fruit with patience and abundantly, and it was because it came into or was received into 
honest and good heart. They treated it as it was the Word of God. They accepted the information provided them by the gospel message. They recognized that it was meant for them, that they stood before God condemned, and they wanted to be saved from their sins. They knew that only God could do that. So as they are pricked in their conscience, their conscience condemns them because of the truth that they had heard. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? As I said earlier, we would all love to hear people, having heard the word, respond in this way. What a joy it would be. Yet we see in Luke 8, as we studied this morning, that there are three kinds of bad soil. That is, the, where the Word of God is not going to accomplish what God would like to see it accomplished, and faithful members of the church, including the gospel preacher, would like to see it accomplished. There's still too much of the world and its allurements that people love. But here is not the case at this time. And Peter takes them as believers and tells them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. So now, this is an important point to keep in mind because he then says, saving yourselves from this untoward generation. Hmm, saving yourselves, I thought Christ saved us. Well, if ever cooperation between God and man is established in the scriptures, it is here. They've been called by the gospel message, and they've accepted it. They believed it. They did that because they understood it, and they were willing and ready out of an honest and good heart to obey it. And verse 41 tells us the results. Then they that gladly received his word. Have you ever gladly received something? Well, all of us should have when it comes to hearing the gospel, which is God's power to save us from sin. And they gladly heard it. Now, notice the caliber of these people. These are not people who cared nothing about God. They're Jews, and they knew they were to approach God by the authority of Moses and the law of Moses. They've come to Jerusalem for that purpose. They had no idea what was about to happen. It describes them, if you notice in the beginning of the chapter, as devout men. They were dedicated to God. They wanted to serve Him. But note this, devoutly religious, but devoutly and religiously in error. That had served its purpose for a while, while the law of Moses was the way that the Jews approached God, but not any longer. And so these people had to say, we've got to change. We've got to do some amending of our lives if we want salvation. So and they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Then you see further that it doesn't stop just with them obeying the plan of salvation and being baptized into Christ. Notice that they had fully repented because, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice the proper awe and respect for God and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And the togetherness and the fellowship that was there, listen, and all that believed together had all things common. They had an attitude that when a need arose, we'll take what we have and use it to satisfy that need. Now, there have been some who would rest the other scriptures, W-R-E-S-T, that means literally in the Greek to torture the scriptures. They would say that, see, you have socialism taught here. And all that believed together had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men. See this wealth distribution here? And every, as every man had need. That's not what that's saying. A long time ago, back in the 60s, I heard where people who advocated communism, not necessarily Marxism, Leninism, the kind that rules China did rule Russia, but just simply 
commune, communal living where nothing belongs to anybody more than it belongs to anybody else. And uh, this was used to try to say, see, that's the way the church was back in those days. But what's being said here is simply that brethren who see the need of other brethren and those brethren can't supply it for themselves are willing to take what they have and use it. And it still serves as a pattern for us today if we had brethren who were in a situation where they couldn't supply for themselves. There's your New Testament authority. Can you still read that? It tells us that we're supposed to take care of one another. So it is in Galatians 6, 2, as you therefore have opportunity, do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. That's what they were doing. You've got a divine commentary here on how to carry out what Paul told the Galatians to do, and so tells every member of the church. But I read further than just their response originally to the gospel, because you see their belief in repentance carried them beyond their obedience to the gospel to their living of the Christian life in the Lord's church to which he had added every one of them. So they were actively faithful to God as children of God. Well, we want to see that, as I've said several times already, among all those who hear the gospel. Wouldn't it be wonderful every time the gospel is preached and people are hearing it who are not Christians that they would respond in this way? Well, certainly it would. But if you listened this morning and studied with us, you saw that the Lord tried to vaccinate his people uh, against those that would hear the word, but they wouldn't obey it or they wouldn't stay with it. And yet we're still to teach the truth and to live the truth before all the world, regardless of how people respond to it. Now, if you go on over to the next sermon I want to look at, you will find that that is Stephen's sermon. It's a great sermon. And Stephen is described in Acts chapter 6. Stephen, a man full of faith of the Holy Ghost. And that's in the list that describes the seven servants of tables there in the church at Jerusalem who were appointed to take care of a certain matter. And then we find that he's a fellow who uh, does a lot of preaching. And his preaching got him killed. If you'll notice in Acts chapter 7, he didn't mince words when it came to telling the people what they needed to hear. Now, Philip, had, or rather Peter, had done about the same thing. And you'll see that while Philip goes to Samaria, you have Stephen, and he was one of those appointed to serve tables too. But you'll see that Stephen now is preaching there at a certain synagogue in Jerusalem. These are Greek names. They were Jews born outside of Judea and Jerusalem. They're assembling at a synagogue that catered to those men. That's one reason we introduced Saul of Tarsus there, because he was one of those Hellenist Jews also. And we see then that as he goes through the history of the Jews, he comes down to verse 51 and he really pours the coal on and says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. Now, notice the response. When they heard this, it doesn't say they were pricked in their heart. It says they were cut to the heart. And they were so enraged that they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, they're not very happy campers, are they? Yet he told them what they needed to hear so they could be saved. Now, Peter had not done any different when he stood before those devout Jews on Pentecost. He said, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. Well, that's not too pleasant a thing to have to come to grips with in your life. These people didn't either. But notice it did not have the same effect on them as it did those on the day of Pentecost. Those on the day of Pentecost gladly received the word. Well, anything but gladly can be applied to these auditors here. They wanted to kill the preacher. They would have killed God, but they couldn't get to him. 
By the way, when they could get to him, they did kill him. And so it is that we find that result to the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Isn't that amazing? It's the same word of God. It's preached with the same love for lost souls. And yet the response is different. One is pricked in the heart, their conscience eats them alive. It moves them to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they gladly receive the word told to repent and be baptized. And they prove that they were dedicated to the Lord because they continued, kept on keeping on, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in prayers, and fellowship, breaking of bread, and so on. But not these. Now the word of God had not changed. The dedication and conviction of the preacher was the same. Two different men, but same. The love for God, the love for the truth, the love for lost souls was there. But what's the problem? These folks that heard Stephen preached were not at all honest in their hearts. They didn't have an honest and good heart. I know they didn't. If they had, they would have responded the same way those people did on the Pentecost. All honest and good-hearted people always respond the same way when the gospel is preached and they see their need for it. It's true of everyone who's ever obeyed the gospel. And I want you who have obeyed the gospel to remember the time that you decided you needed to obey the gospel. You weren't ready to kill the preacher. You were happy he preached the truth to you. It may have worked on you several days. It may have worked on you several weeks or months. But there came that point where you said, I am not going to lose my soul in a devil's hell. It's my fault. I'm in the mess I'm in. God never did it to me. I left him, and now he's offering me pardon through Jesus Christ if I will accept his way of pardon in obedience to the gospel. And that's what they did on the day at Pentecost. But here are these who now kill the preacher. And that's exactly what they did. Well, there's another result. One, they love the truth. They care about it. They want to obey it. And they do. The other, they don't have good and honest hearts. They reject it. They can't get it God. So they kill the preacher. And Saul of Tarsus is introduced to us right there. They, he held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen. Then all you have to do is read about his life as a persecutor of the church to realize that he was full of hatred for the cause of Christ, considering them a faction and a blasphemous bunch of people. But that's not the end of it. I said we would look at results of three sermons. One, you see good and honest hearted people recognizing their sins, knowing they were lost, and willing to obey the truth, and even interrupting the sermon to ask, what's our duty to God to gain remission of sins? The other, hearing the saying, but they're cut to the heart because they don't, they don't at all want to change. There's no honesty about them. The truth did not make them any different. Now remember, we concluded a lectureship just a few weeks ago on the truth, the importance of it. I don't see how you can read very far in the Bible and especially the New Testament and not read about the importance of truth. Such passages as John 8, 31 and 32, and John 17, 17. But now when we come down to Acts 17, we have a response of this sermon different from both the others. Peter preached one, Stephen preached the other, and now Paul preaches this one. They're all inspired of the Holy Spirit. They're all preaching the word of God from heaven. They're preaching the same gospel that the Lord had commissioned them to preach throughout the world, Mark 16, 15. And yet when we come down to this audience, know how he brought it to a conclusion. Basically, they concluded it. He's on Mars Hill. He's speaking to a bunch of Gentile Greeks, many of them, of the Greek philosophy schools of various sorts. But notice what he does. And the times of this ignorance, all the way they had lived for a good while, God winked at. But what's the situation now as I stand before you, Paul could say, 
as I preach to you. But now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, what's coming that says I ought to repent? What's coming that says I ought to have a change of heart toward what you've been preaching? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. What he's saying simply is that as surely as God hath raised Jesus Christ from the dead, there is a final day coming when all men will be judged. And on that basis, you need to use the time you have left to repent of your past life of sin, obey the gospel, and live for the Lord. But notice, they didn't fall over themselves full of gladness to obey the gospel. At least the great majority didn't. They weren't all upset to the point of take up stones or whatever they could do to kill Paul, although at other times that had happened, but not in this case. Notice verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We'll hear thee again of this matter. What was Paul's reaction? So Paul departed from among them. Look at verse 32 again. They were complacent and mentally lethargic because what he was saying didn't go along with the general concept of the Greek mind toward being resurrected. Regardless of the schools of philosophy and religion among the Greeks, and it had been that way for hundreds of years, all of them tended to think that the body is a handicap to the spirit. And when you die and the spirit leaves, you're set at great liberty and freedom. And you're preaching a gospel that says, I've got to come back into this body? How ridiculous is that? And they just pretty well thumbed their nose at him. He didn't even arouse them enough for them to become angry at him. And certainly, as I said, they were not moved by the truth enough to gladly say, let's hear more. Now, there were a few. If you look in verse 34, Howbeit certain men claved unto him and believed. And he gives some names. Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. But those were just a few. The impact here on the majority was, oh, this is not what we were looking for. You get that idea a lot of times with people today in America. We have had it so good overall and in general throughout this land. That doesn't mean there haven't been upsets and ups and downs and poverty and various things. I'm talking about in general, the general history of our 240-year period. That we get so caught up in being comforted in physical matters Unless there's some big dog and pony show that outdid the last one we saw, it just doesn't much get our attention. Unless it fits into the American concept of how we live, there's just not much there. Now look round about you at the denominational churches and the churches founded upon the commandments and doctrines of men, and you see people looking for, well, what can you do for me? You hear the health and wealth gospel. I'm a servant of Christ, therefore I should be a multimillionaire and all this kind of rigmarole. The only ones that tend to come out with much money in that is the fellow that preached it. It's always interesting that he's asking them to give <laughs> their money to him, but he never tends to demonstrate it too much by giving any amount of money to somebody else. It's always kind of going one way. Have you ever noticed the health and wealth gospel, how it works? Well, that's nothing to that. But here are these people, my point being this, this went against the grain of the current, regular, long-time Greek way of thinking. So they didn't get upset one way or the other. They just said, oh, we'll hear you another day on this matter, and went on about whatever they went to next. Probably went down to Whataburger and had something to eat. 
that's the way we tend to handle things. Well, then I'm tired of this. Let's, you know, let's wait and go somewhere else. I, I really wonder sometimes about the people in the entertainment business. Now, think about the word entertainment. And they always are trying to come out with a new blockbuster that outdoes the last one. What do you do to do that? Think about it. There's only so much you can do. If, even if you're of the pornographic crowd, which really a lot of movies would be best classified if they're some sort of pornographic because they got some part of it in there. It just may not be as bad as some others, but it's, a, it's appealing to the lust of the flesh. Some way or the other, they're going to do that. It may be about Lassie come home, but before she got there, she found some other dog on the way to run around with. They'll get it in there some way. Now, the point being this, how do you, how do you finally come up, to, up one more than that? Because that's where the people are. That's what they're looking for. And you see every type of program come on, and they can't just tell a decent story. It'd be interesting, though I wouldn't want to see it, to see how they would do Leave It to Beaver today. And they certainly wouldn't call something Father Knows Best. They'd probably have something the mess Father made out of it. Because that's the way they think. But how do you keep trying to come up with something different? Well, with these Greeks at this time, they had their set way of thinking. And here's something that said you've got to get out of that. And we don't want to hear that. Now watch. When you go out and teach the truth, keeping in mind what we heard this morning, the different type of soils, keeping in mind what we heard this morning about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost boy, and what they represent. Now, looking at the responses to these three sermons where the preachers were all dedicated to God and good Christians, where they're preaching the same word of God, the changes are there in the people. And I tell you now, if you go out and preach the gospel in its purity, whether it's one-on-one, one-on-fifteen, -on -one, one -on or preaching to a thousand, everybody you preach to is going to fall into one of these three categories. Every one of them. They're either going to gladly receive the word and obey it, or to one degree or the other, they're going to become very angry at you for telling them what they needed to hear and it didn't suit them, or else they're just ambivalent about the matter. Now you say, well, I don't know so much about that. Give me a fourth category. Give me a fourth category. Now, there may be degrees of categories within each one of these, but they're all going to be the same way. You, tell, you go to your own life, those who have tried to study with other people, and you watch it. You found some, they were just so happy once they understood the truth to obey it. You've had others, I mean, they got hotter than they could get at you for telling them the truth. Then others just, you know, that's enough. I've got more important things to do. Now, as I bring the lesson to a close, let me mention this. You can have the same thing happen to members of the church, where at one time they were enthusiastic and zealous for the cause of Christ. But they become complacent, and they become dead in trespasses and sins. You can find others, and when you point out they are dead and complacent <laughs> in their sins, then they get just as angry at you as they could. And they kill you if they thought they could. And as a preacher, I can tell you they'll fire you. They'll put you on the road a little bit and say all manner of things. Then there are those, they just let it pass right off. Water off the duck's back, as we say. It's not going to bother them at all. I'm always thankful for those who have honest and good hearts, those who love the truth supremely, those who are dedicated completely to the cause of Christ. They make the difference. They will be the ones who will hear, Well done, thou good. That word keeps showing up, doesn't it? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Good and faithful servant servant. Enter ye into the joys 
of thy Lord. Brethren, it's not hard to see these things if we'll just take time to look at them. So if you're an evangelist, and by that I mean somebody seeking the souls of others, one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's somebody standing preaching like I am, whatever, as a member of the Lord's church and faithful to Him, you're trying to teach others at work, at school, then know they're all going to fall in one of these last three categories. Know they're going to have what we studied about this morning. And then steel yourselves against those who would hinder you from living the Christian life, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and in teaching the truth and contending for the faith. We're taught to preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the faith unto fables. Notice that the job falling upon our shoulders is to preach the word. And you do it by reproving and rebuking and exhorting. There's no other way you can teach the word properly as it's rightly divided and not do one or a combination of those in the process of preaching the word of the people that need it. Notice it's to be instant in season and out of season. There are times when people are more disposed to listen to the truth. There are times when they're not. But what's the duty of the teacher? To never cease teaching the same truth. There may be people get tired of it, but that's their problem. That's not your problem. Your problem is stay steadfast in teaching it and in living it and exposing the errors of man. I said this morning that sin's our greatest enemy. They're sins of omission and sins of commission. James 4, 17, 1 John 3, and verse 4. All of it's a violation of heaven, and we've got to change. That's repentance. There's got to be that desire based upon our faith in God, which is formed in us by the Word of God. And we'll stay with these things. Now, the thing I want to point out about both lessons today, if you haven't already noticed it, it can't get much more first principle and basic than this. And yet, no matter how much more Bible you learn, how well you learn the Greek of the New Testament and the Hebrew of the Old, and how well you learn the rules of biblical hermeneutics, that is, ascertaining Bible authority, how the Bible authorizes, how we ascertain it, you will never go beyond the foundations of the first principles of truth to build their own if you build correctly. These are the fundamentals that all men must know. And we in the church must understand as we go about our business of teaching people the wonderful words of life. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you this afternoon to honestly receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul, to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be obedient to Him in being baptized for the remission of your sins. The Lord will add you to His church, and there you can serve Him faithfully. As a child of God, are you still being alive and active and zealous for the cause of Christ? Preaching the same old Jerusalem gospel and living it out in your life and contending for it? Or has it sort of slipped aside and things of this world have captured our attention and things have slipped slide away? Well, we ask you to humbly recognize that and repent of your sins or any other sin in your life. Come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.